Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk from the online seminar series Progress and Visions in the Scientific Study of the Mind-Matter Relation, held in 2018. The seminars aim to bring together researchers from around the globe with a background in mathematics or physics who are interested in the scientific study of consciousness and the mind-matter relation. While each seminar session consists of a talk and a discussion, the latter is not recorded and the following video will only contain the talk. We hope you enjoy it. For further information, please visit mind-matter-relation.org. Well, thank you so much, uh, Johannes and Robin, for setting setting up this ex experiment. Um, and thanks to everybody who's who's participating. I'm really looking forward to the discussions. Um, I, w I think Johannes and Robin have already said this, but for me, this is this is an experiment technologically. I haven't given a talk quite like this before, but it's also very much an experiment intellectually. I'm I'm far outside my my comfort zone. I'm talking about topics that I think we all find very challenging and hard hard to get to grips with. Certainly, I do. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to throw around some perspectives and ideas um, that may, maybe lead somewhere, maybe 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 don't. Um, but um, and the hope really of starting a discussion rather than <laughs> rather than making any any definitive claim about the way forward in this field. I don't I don't I'm, I don't know what the way forward and I'm not sure I'm convinced that anybody does. So my title was Quanta and Qualia. Um, I want to acknowledge some influences and I think they're familiar to many people, but for those of you who to, to whom they're not, I, I really want to recommend them very strongly. One one article that's long influenced me is um, early the early William James piece, Are We Automata, which was published in the journal Mind in 1879, um, and which focuses very much, well, focuses on the question, are we automata? Gives the answer, um, no, at that point, although James's philosophy shifted over the years, um, and focuses on the, what I still think is a uh, underexplored and, and compelling question how we could possibly how consciousness could possibly have evolved in the form that it currently that we currently find it and another major influence on me um i, I fear i won't represent either of them very well but still i'm i'm, I'm aware of a debt um is david chalmers's book and, and many of david chalmers's other articles um, which are collected on his web page so let me borrow some terminology from one of David Chalmers' articles. Um, we, it's very helpful, I find it very helpful at least, to distinguish between these two notions of what we mean when we say that something emerges from something else. And, and we're interested here in particular the relationship between consciousness and the rest of physics. But we could, we could also look around in physics itself and see whether there are other examples of emergence and whether they might uh, they might perhaps even be relevant to this one. So we're going to say a high-level phenomenon is strongly emergent with respect to a low-level domain when it arises from that domain, um, but facts, truths concerning that are just not deducible, even in principle, from truths in the low-level domain. And it's weakly emergent when, again, it arises from the domain, uh, and it's not really obvious uh, um, at first sight, um, why it should emerge, um, but it, uh, it's unexpected, but those truths um, are in principle deducible from the low-level domain. So consciousness, um, on Chalmers' view and uh, also on my view, given our current understanding of physics, quantum theory, um, general relativity, any of the more speculative theories that might unify quantum theory and GR, string theory, um, any any of the versions of quantum theory that might go a little bit beyond standard quantum theory, uh, for any of those, we consciousness is not weakly emergent, it appears to be strongly emergent. Why do I think that? And again, I'm borrowing arguments from other people and uh, sum, summarizing them as best I can um, in, with, in my own slight paraphrases. But let me give you some reasons, at least. So uh, I'm going to give you four, and they're 
they overlap and they interlock they're interrelated but they they seem to be not they seem to be not quite identical to each other nonetheless and the first is the conceivable conceivability argument this now by now well rehearsed idea in the literature on consciousness of, that there can be things that we can conceive of philosophical zombies which materially are identical to us absolutely the same as us all as far as all the laws of physics um, that we currently understand uh, have to say, uh, they are the same things as us, but they're not conscious. So that appears to be a, a logically conceivable possibility. It's not that one believes they're, they're out there on a different planet, um, but it seems you can conceive of a universe which share, shares all, all material properties of ours, um, and therefore, therefore share, has creatures like us, um, but those creatures are zombies. It seems to be a contingent fact about our world, from what we understand so far, that we're not zombies, that we happen to be conscious. Then there's the knowledge argument. Uh, you could give a complete description of a physical situation, for instance, everything to do with um, the perception of the color red, and if you're talking to somebody who's never seen red, who's a red novice, it doesn't seem to give them knowledge of what it's like to see red. They can understand the operation of the brain. They can understand everything you say about light and the spectrum. Um, and yet they still have no idea what, what this, this perception of red is as an experience. And then there's the argument from evolution. So, as we understand things, um, we, we evolved from, well, through a long chain, from single-celled organisms. And surely our consciousness must have evolved um, alongside, alongside our material evolution. So we have this primate level consciousness that does all these wonder, weird and wonderful things for us. It appears to be incredibly well designed to give us survival advantages. Um, if you look at what sort of things are we conscious of? Um, and even what qualities of consciousness are associated with those things? They seem to be highly focused on evolutionarily relevant things. We're very conscious of threats. We're conscious of food. We're conscious of pleasurable things, which on the whole are good for us. Uh, and none of this seems explicable from the laws of physics as we understand it. It just seems, it's, a, uh, it's a remarkable fact about consciousness, but it's not a fact that theories seems to have, a, have an explanation for. And finally, the explanatory argument. So you could phrase this another way. The laws, what do the laws of physics talk about? They, as we currently understand them, they talk about manifolds um, and matter distributions on manifolds in the case of GR. They talk about the dynamics of states in, in Hilbert space, according to quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. Uh, what they don't talk about is the sort of thing that we seem to find when we try to describe consciousness, um, which is, among other things, some sort of data selection pr principle. You look, at, you look at our brain, you look at the physical characteristics of our brain, you need an enormous amount of data to describe our brain in configuration space, um, in classical mechanics or in, um, in quantum theory. We, our consciousness is certainly not identical to that description, and it it seems to give a, a much more succinct description of our, our, our uh, of our mental state. We're, we're not aware of the full physical states of our brains. We're not aware of anything like the volume of information that would be required to describe the full physical states of our brain. And there just seems to be a an evident logical gap that you could point directly to. Um, we, what we have are dynamical laws. What we'd need to even start talking about consciousness is a data selection principle. And you can't derive what we need, the principle, from what we have, the laws. So I imagine all, I mean, I know, of course, all these arguments are controversial, and I imagine the audience will have various opinions. I'm just trying to give uh, my own perspective and the arguments that at the moment persuade me. Why do I care? Um, so, if you take, as I do, the view that consciousness appears to be strongly emergent from the rest of physics, 
and your goal is to understand nature as well as possible and you work on fundamental physics and you would like a unified description of nature then you should feel unhappy at least in the sense that um we we, we seem to be failing in that goal so far uh, the history of physics and the history of science in general is one in which think we've made a lot of progress by starting with phenomena that appear to be strongly emergent and then understanding as we understand the world better that in fact they're weakly emergent it wasn't obvious um, how tides fitted in with uh, what we understood of dynamics but eventually through Newton's laws and gravitation and the analysis of tides uh, we got there it wasn't obvious even for centuries after that um, how how life fitted into the picture but thanks to uh, thanks to Darwin and others, uh, we now f un believe that we understand at least the material evolution of life um, as not, a, not just consistent with, but implied by the rest of the rest of the physical laws. So we seem to have an op we seem to have a big challenge here. Uh, we have an absolutely fundamental phenomenon, consciousness, uh, that appears to be strongly emergent, uh, and as a physicist trying to learn from history one one would like if one can to do something about that um, and to ultimately get to a story in which it was weakly emergent well you might like that but is it possible i i don't know um my hunch is that there is unknown physics that is connected with the appearance of strong emergence and connected with consciousness but of course i don't know that it's it's just a it's a hunch um it could be that strong emergence simply is the way the world is and i uh i have to go further than that um i have to admit that i you know i i could sketch i could sketch ways in which we might understand something about consciousness that we don't understand so far but I have to admit, I can't see any way in which unknown physics could completely eliminate the, the appearance of strong emergence of all aspects of consciousness. So this seems to be the toughest problem out there, in, to, uh, to my mind, in understanding nature. It's tougher than the quantum measurement problem, where we could see at least toy models that offer solutions, and we could see hope of um, complete solutions. It's tougher than unifying quantum theory and gravity, um, or at least in the sense that we can we may be wrong about the ways forward, but we can see possible ways forward. It, it seems as though with enough technical and conceptual work, we could get there. And perhaps other people could see more clearly than me, but I, I, can't, I can't see how to sketch any sort of program that would get all the way with consciousness and physics. That said, um, as I've already hinted, I do think there's logical space for some deeper connection with consciousness between consciousness and fundamental physics and if you're a super optimist optimist and if you work on foundational questions sometimes you have to be a bit of a super optimist you might think that maybe we can make a little bit of progress and then our perspective shifts might might shift we'd understand the questions a little more clearly uh, maybe we'd see in we make you make one step forward and then you see how you might be able to make another step forward so you could always hope that although you don't see your your way to the end of the path so you don't see how you could possibly explain strong emergence uh maybe that maybe maybe taking a first step um will uh is the crucial thing um and perhaps if perhaps eventually there is a way towards the end of the path you can hope but to re-emphasize like uh, i haven't i haven't got any vision to offer you at the moment i'd be very interested if other people have Okay, so what what could we hope to achieve um, if we if we just have a wish list and a sort of dream and we're not really constrained as to what sort of laws we could dream up? Well, it seems to me in principle you could hope for uh, new physical laws that could address the conceivability argument, and and the why I think that is, um, while it seems to me that indeed philosophical zombies are logically conceivable, you could imagine a some sort of new law 
that applies in our universe. It doesn't have to apply in all universes, but it applies in ours um, and makes it a contingent fact because this law applies that we are, we are not zombies and presumably other creatures on Earth are not zombies because of the specific features of these specific laws that we have yet to discover. You could also hope to make progress on the explanatory argument. Uh, remember, the explanatory argument was saying we don't have a data selection principle for consciousness and we don't have anything in physics that could give us one. Well, you could hope a new physical law could be of a rather different type from the ones we have, and it could include a, a data selection principle or at least something from which you could derive a data selection principle. And you could hope, perhaps, um, also to make at least partial progress on the evolutionary argument. So if, remember we're just dreaming at the moment, but if you have new physical laws that modify known dynamics, perhaps and presumably very subtly, um, and they do it in a way that encourages the development of complex consciousness, so somehow if you start with things that are barely conscious or proto-conscious, the dynamics tend to push these things in a direction of more and more complex consciousness. Well, you've at least got logical space there where you, you might uh, begin to try begin to think you could sketch some sort of story about the evolution of complex consciousness from primitive consciousness. And I, I, put, I put particular weight on the argument from evolution um, and as, insofar as I ho have hope at all, perhaps most hope on the fact that the, the possibility that thinking about evolution might give us some idea of a way forward. So let me let me say a little bit about that, um, starting not with consciousness, but with quantum foundations. So there's, there are venerable and respectable views of the foundations of quantum theory that are subjectivist, essentially subjectivist or idealist, um, in which uh, reality is uh, consists of the perceptions or the observations of observers um, uh, and uh, not, there is not an external material reality that has the same status. I don't, I'm not particularly attracted to those views on views of the foundations of quantum theory or the foundations of physics. Um, and I probably wouldn't be attracted any, so attracted anyway, but I would give them more weight if it weren't for the fact that we understand Darwinian evolution and uh, both theoretically and, and, there's, and that there's compelling empirical evidence for it. So evolution tells us that observers like ourselves emerged from an initial state, presumably a quantum state, that as far as we understand it didn't initially contain any observers. And I find it very hard to give a coherent account of that process within a subjectivist or an idealistic framework because somehow you, you have the only real things are the perceptions or the observations of the observers and yet you have to talk about the evolution of observers at a time when there weren't any by definition, there weren't any observers around, and so there is nothing real to talk about. So if we, if we, if our situation was that we were just, we were alive here and now, and it seemed rather magical, and we had no understanding of how we got here or where we were going, um, and no, no story of evolution, maybe no evidence for it, that we, we'd have other concerns, um, but this wouldn't be such a pressing concern. It wouldn't be, to my mind, such a strong argument against subjectivism. So I feel the same sort of way, um, uh, although a little less confidently, um, about stories of consciousness. So there are epiphenomenal views of consciousness um, in which it, it is defined by the material world, but it has no influence on the material world. Um, in, in such views, you can run Darwinian evolution entirely in, in the material world. Uh, and that gives a completely satisfactory account of how we got to be the sort of material creatures we are. And it just happens to be a fact that um, this epiphenomenal consciousness is attached to creatures like us. Uh, I find it very, very hard to accept that somehow there are epiphenomenal laws 
that fit the, make the material evolution, which is under, uh, can be understood in terms of physical dynamical laws, and the evolution of our consciousnesses somehow proceeds side by side, um, as though they were designed, they were sitting there in advance waiting for creatures like us so that they could equip us with it, exactly the sort of consciousness we have. So that it looks to us as though we, we have free will, as though we're influencing the material world, um, as though we're focusing on things that are important for our survival. Um, <coughs> and yet, actually none of that, in an important sense, none of that is really true. None of that is necessary to explain our material evolution. I've, uh, people who've thought deeply about this question and come to the opposite conclusion, but I find it very hard to accept that picture. Uh. So, um, I want to say a little more about consciousness and evolution and uh, speculative ideas in that direction. But first, let me sort of limit what I think I can possibly say. Uh, I think we can hope, perhaps, to make some progress on the arguments that I've just mentioned. I don't have any clear idea at all on how new physics could address the knowledge argument on the, uh, the redness of red and um, uh, and more generally, the qualitative nature of conscious experience. Maybe, maybe Chalmers's recent discussions of panpsychism and proto-panpsychism um, are helpful starting points. Uh, certainly, I think the articles are uh, compelling reading and uh, uh, fascinating reading. But I, I really don't have any thoughts uh, to uh, to offer on this. I'm afraid. Okay, so I know many of the people in the audience work on quantified nations, but I'm not sure that everyone does by any means. Um, so with apologies for those to whom this is very familiar, um, let me say a little bit about where I think we are in quantified nations. So there's one common, one common view, um, uh, which is controversial. Uh, so the common view is that classical physics is strongly emergent from quantum theory as we currently understand it. Um, and perhaps and a sort of stronger version of that view is classical physics is strongly emergent. In other words, it's not explicable. And that's just fine. Um, you have quantum theory. You have classical physics. You, you need classical physics in order to understand quantum theory. Um, and you, you can't hope to have a fully unified picture of both. So these, this used to be close to the dominant view. This is, this is implied by at least some versions of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory. Uh, and people who adhere to those versions are just very relaxed about this strong emergence. The classical world is necessary to make sense of the quantum world, but logically, logically independent of it. I'm not in that camp, um, and I think most of most of the well, I'm not in that camp. A, lo a lot of other people these days are not in that camp. Um, we're not relaxed at all about this. Uh, we take the appearance of the classical world and the difficulty in explaining precisely how classicality emerges from quantum theory, assuring us that quantum theory is incomplete. And if you take that view, well, one possible way forward is to try and complete the theory by adding some extra mathematical quantities. Uh, John Bell called them beables, things, things that can be in the world. Uh, it's a slightly ugly word, but they are able to be in the world, beables. So there are well-known beable extensions of quantum theory. Uh, maybe the most well-known is De Broglie, De Broglie Bohm pilot wave theory, uh, where you add extra variables and uh, that's, and that's a price you pay. Uh, you, in exchange for paying that price, you get a, an explanation of how the classical world can be described along with quantum theory. There are other problems, which I don't want to go into here. It's not, it's not that uh, uh, everything looks fine and there, there are no remaining issues. But a point that I do want to take, take a little further here is once you've added to quantum theory, you also, even if it wasn't your original intention, you've given yourself a way of subtly altering 
the dynamics of quantum theory. And to my mind, actually, you've given yourself some motivation for doing it. Um, so I'll say more about that in, in the following slides. First, what, what are these things? What are the beables? Well, I want to be really agnostic here. I, um, we don't know whether they exist. If they do, we don't know. There are various lines of thought and, uh, uh, in quantum foundations. So they could, for instance, be, as uh, de Broglie bohm theory suggests, trajectories of particles that are as associated with each, uh, each quantum particle. They could, as some versions of dynamical collapse models suggest, be point-like flashes that describe the centers of, uh, of co intrinsic collapses that are supposed, according to these theories, to occur in nature. They could, as uh, some attempts to extend Gelman and Hartle I Hartle's ideas on consistent history suggest, be something like sequences of projections in Hilbert space that are somehow, sorry, I'm let me try and use the pointer. So yeah, sequences of projections in Hilbert space that are somehow picked out for us by a mathematical rule that, alas, we don't have a detailed version of at the moment, but one can hope to find. They, uh, we're going to be agnostic about the details, but they're extra variables. Let me just, sorry, no, that, I need to go forward, excuse me. Okay, so let me say, summarize the story about emergence as I understand it. And again, this, uh, this is a slightly controversial take on where we are, not just in the relationship between consciousness and physics, but also in the relationship between conscious, quantum theory and classical physics. But on this diagram, I tried to sort of put together the relationship between various fundamental theories with these dotted arrows highlighting what appears to be strong, to me at least, to be strong emergence. These solid arrows highlighting what appears to be weak emergence, stuff that you could explain in principle. Um, at least you think you can sketch how you would go about explaining in principle. And then this special case on the diagram of the relationship between quantum theory and gravity, where we don't really think, I, we, most people don't think either emerges from the other, but rather that we have two distinct theories uh, that ought to be part of some grander unified theory that we don't currently have. So according to this diagram, uh, classical dynamics strongly emerges from quantum theory. We need beables or something, something else in order, to, something be beyond quantum theory in order to give an explanation of classical dynamics. Consciousness strongly emerges from everything. Um, we don't have an explanation of consciousness's evolution from quantum theory. We don't have an explanation of the evolution of consciousness from Darwinian evolution, although we had to explain some material evolution. Um, and I haven't even bothered to put in an arrow, but we don't, we don't have a story about the evolution of consciousness from general relativity either. Um, and by the way, even if we thought the classical dynamics were fundamental and we hadn't discovered quantum theory, we still wouldn't have an explanation of the evolution of consciousness. So we would have another dotted line going from classical dynamics here to consciousness as evolution. Okay, so going back to beables and how they might alter that picture. Here I've got this, a standard cartoon version of the Schrodinger cat experiment in which a radioactive atom may or may not decay, and a detector may or may not therefore register the decay, and whether, depending whether it does or it doesn't, it may or may not uh, release a hammer, which may or may not smash um, a vial which contains poison, which if released will kill the cat, and if not released will leave the cat alive. So, I'm not, it's, I'm not sure how readable the text is on this slide. It, it doesn't look quite the way I expected to, is it? Can anybody tell me whether it's readable or not? It's not so readable. Sorry. So maybe, maybe it's if not, you could not just... very readable. No, sorry. Okay, yeah. Apolo apologies for that. But thank you, thank you for letting me. Okay, 
so what the text says is beables add to the quantum wave function description and select out one of the two macroscopic alternative pictures as realized. So the sorts of theories I, uh, I've alluded to, the Broybohm theory or dynamical collapse models or more tentatively consistent histories with a set selection rule will give us a story in which along with the evolution of the quantum wave function, which includes both possible pictures, the cat, cat being left alive at the end of the chain and dead, we have beables, but the beables are attached to one or the other. So in the case I've picked out, these blue dots um, correspond to the atom not having been detected and the hammer not being released uh, and the beaker not being smashed and the cat being left alive. So as I said, and this is the second uh, sentence uh, on, on the slide, we know of beable theories that have this feature. We don't know that they're right. We don't know that they're even roughly right. But we do know that um, uh, this is the way the world could be. And um, there are research programs trying to develop, develop these models and um, make them more consistent with the rest of physics as well as non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, it's ah good. Okay, um, so the, the traditional aim of Beable theories was um, and was simply to add variables to quantum theory, but not to alter the predictions of quantum theory. Uh, so, for instance, the De Broglie-Bohm pilot wave theory in its original form does precisely that. Um, it makes no new predictions. But Beable theories do allow us to define generalizations of quantum theory that make testably different predictions. And to my mind, once you have the Beables there, you should at least half expect that they have some sort of dynamical role. They, um, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly odd picture in which they, uh, they're just witnesses that allow you to talk about the classicality of the world, but they, they do nothing at all. Uh, they, they, haven't, they play no role at all in the evolution of physics. So one way, and this is perhaps a rather crude way of uh, modifying quantum theory, but still uh, a logically possible way, is to start with a beable theory that's consistent with standard quantum theory, and then to take the, uh, and that will tell you a story about the configuration of beables as they, uh, and throughout space and time in principle, and then to take the probability that you get the standard probability, this one, um, and multiply it by some other factor, let's just call it W, that depends on the configuration itself. And then take this to be the actual probability, the new probability in our new theory, which is no longer going to respect quantum theory. So you have to make, you have to make sure that you still have a well-defined probability distribution after doing this, which means you, ha you have to make sure that these, weight, these, these modified probabilities are normalizable. But you can imagine weight factors that will allow that. And then you have to actually, of course, carry out the renormalization, which is why I've put proportional rather than equals here. But you could do all this, and there's at least logical space for theories in which uh, the beables through, through these weight factors make different predictions about beable configurations, and hence different predictions about um, observable features of the classical world from those we would expect from standard quantum theory. So again, I think I, I should read out the text here. A, a modified beable theory could weight the outcomes to slightly increase the probability of the live cat path and decrease the probability of the dead cat path, for instance. Um, but is there any motivation to consider any such theory? That's the, that's the question at the bottom of the slide. So the idea here is uh, our, weight, our weight factor could, for instance, be chosen so that it prefers life over death, or it prefers consciousness over lack of consciousness. And there's at least a subtle weighting in favor of that, so that when you do an experiment like this, there's maybe a, a one in a trillion extra chance of the cat surviving compared to what standard quantum theory suggests, and a one in a trillion smaller chance of the cat dying. And that's good news for cats, but is it scientifically motivated in any way? Does it get us anywhere? Um, in trying to think about the link between physics and consciousness. 
Well, let me let me try and explore that further. Yeah, uh, apologies. These I, I don't quite understand what's happened with the upload. The slides look fine in the PDF, um, but let me let me read out these quotations from William James. They they bear for they they deserve to be read out anyway. Um, they uh, they're compellingly and beautifully written. Uh, somebody once said so. William James, of course, was the brother of Henry James, the novelist. Um, uh, and Henry James has been described as a novelist who writes like a philosopher, uh, and William James as a philosopher who writes like a novelist. I think, I think there's something to that, as these quotations success, uh, attest. So the first one is focusing very much on evolution um, and its relationship to consciousness. The point which, as evolutionists, we are bound to hold fast to is that all the new forms of being that make their appearance are really nothing more than results of the redistribution of the original and unchanging materials. The self-same atoms which, chaotically dispersed, made the nebula now jammed and temporarily caught in peculiar positions form our brains. And the evolution of the brains, if understood, would be simply the account of how the atoms came to be so caught and jammed. In this story, no new natures, no factors not present at the beginning are introduced at any later stage. But with the dawn of consciousness, an entirely new nature seems to slip in, something whereof the potency was not given in the mere outward atoms of the original chaos. So that leads one, if one takes that seriously, to an epiphenomenal picture, um, uh, which James characterizes in the second quotation as, as telling us this, uh, that feeling is a mere collateral product of our nervous processes unable to react upon them any more than a shadow reacts on the steps of a traveler whom it accompanies. Inert, uninfluential, a simple passenger in the voyage of life, it's allowed to remain on board, but not to touch the helm or handle the rigging. So this was not a view, at least in this article, that James advocated. Uh, it's a rather compelling description of his unease with the, with the picture. I think, sorry, I think I skipped a slide here. Yes. Uh, so I have some further quotes from James, which are um, hopefully readable. Uh, this strange correlation, strange on the epiphenomenal view, correlation between the qualities of consciousness um, and their apparent but illusory evolutionary benefit. So if we start here in the top quote, it's long been noticed that pleasures are generally associated with beneficial, pains with detrimental experiences. All the fundamental vital processes illustrate this law. Uh, and if I skip to the middle one, but if pleasures and pains have no eff efficacy, one does not see why the most noxious acts, such as burning, might not give a thrill of delight, and the most necessary ones, such as breathing, cause agony. It doesn't matter. if. If consciousness isn't actually doing anything, if it's just coming on for the ride, it doesn't matter whether something's good for us, whether we enjoy something or not, it doesn't change how our material selves are going to act. And so it doesn't, it shouldn't, we shouldn't expect any correlation between pleasure and evolutionary advantage or pain and evolutionary disadvantage. So let me skip forward. I've, I've tried to compare and contrast two stories here. Uh, there's a story about qualia, um, uh, which might, which in, in the view of some people, at least are putative atomic, atomic components of consciousness. It's at least one way of thinking about consciousness. And the story about beables in quantum foundations, which are putative element, elementary constituents of reality. So a physical theory that includes a theory of how qualia are connected to the material world would, in a sense, it would be an advance of what we currently have. It would, in a sense, be a description of consciousness. And it, uh, and it would, if, if the laws were simple, it would be an intriguing advance. But if the qualia are still purely epiphenomenal, it would be a story that tells us nothing about the evolution of consciousness and the form it takes. Those would remain unexplained. And similarly, um, 
if we have a physical theory that includes a theory of how beables are connected to the evolving quantum wave function, that could describe the emergence of classicality. But if the variables are purely epiphenomenal, it stops there. That's their only role. They depend on the wave function, but they have no effect on it. <coughs> now, if the qualia depend on variables, and if they're associated with slightly modified probability rules of the short sort I've waved my hands in the direction of, then they're no longer epiphenomenal. That doesn't solve all our problems, but it seems like progress. So I would say that's, that, that would be a good feature. Um, and if we have, by the same token, if we're using these modified probability rules, the beables would no longer be purely epiphenomenal either. And I think that's also a good feature because it seems a more natural role for beables. And if those rules are weighted even incredibly subtly, because we have millennia to work over, um, so that they favor more qualia rather than fewer when there's an option choosing between them. Maybe we have the beginnings of some sort of explanation for how complex consciousness, or at least more consciousness, uh, came to evolve from primitive consciousness or less consciousness. Should we take this seriously? Well, not very. I mean, if there are better ideas out there or better formed out ideas out there, they should be taken more seriously. Um, but it's a sketch of something. It's a sketch I take seriously enough to be interested in principle, at least, in testing precisely how well, whether, whether living organisms obey the quantum dynamics precisely. I think there's some motivation for experiments in that direction. So, on the very tentative and sketchy sort of view that I've suggested, in which we, we have a beable modified version of quantum theory down here at the bottom, and the beables are associated with qualia. Well, we still haven't really repaired our, we haven't got to where we would like in our story about emergence, but we have this arrow here, which is now perhaps suggesting at least a partial explanation of the emergence of consciousness evolution from our beable modified quantum theory, and a partial explanation of the emergence of uh, consciousness evolution from Darwinian evolution. And this arrow here, which previously was highlight signaling strong emergence uh, now becomes apparent weak emergence. We, we think we can understand how classical dynamics em emerges weakly from, from beable versions of quantum theory, uh, including versions where the probabilities of the beable configurations are slightly modified compared to the standard probabilities. So that would be, uh, that would be progress uh, if it ever were to happen. Um, and perhaps, Perhaps if, if such progress were made, one might, might be able to see a little more clearly how to make further progress. I don't know. So uh, I certainly cheer the efforts by the Vienna groups and others to uh, push macroscopic interferometry experiments towards viruses and bacteria and um, even larger organisms, even when they can uh, uh, devise technology that allow us to do that. Um, it's not that it's not the sort of story I've sketched gives a very strong reason to expect an anomalous outcome in those experiments, but it suggests that at least it's conceivable there could be an anomalous outcome. Um, and it, these are interesting, technologically interesting experiments anyway. So it adds a little bit to my mind to the mo mo motivation for them. Okay. Um, I've been talking for, try to do the arithmetic ahead, about about 50 minutes, is that right, 45? I could I could stop at this point or I could say a little bit about Bell experiments. Uh, I mean, kind of stop um, and let the discussion proceed. Um, and if, if people want to rate, discuss Bell experiments, then I have a few more slides that I could say a little bit about the possibility of anomalous results due to consciousness in Bell experiments. Um, but otherwise, we we could discuss this another time. I think Lucy and Hardy anyways, although although from a rather dis different perspective, is going to talk about 
consciousness related bell experiments in, in, in another seminar in this series. So for the moment, thanks very much for bearing with me. Um, and I'll, I'll stop and maybe we should take a short break and then consider, consider discussion and questions.